Welcome to the webinar, Engaging Civil Society to Support Equitable Access to COVID-19 Vaccines, presented by the International Vaccine Access Center at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Before we get started, I want to let participants know that we will have a Q&A session at the end, so please enter your questions into the Q&A box, and we will get to them after the presentation. There is also a chat box, so please go ahead and introduce yourself there and enter comments that aren't questions. The webinar will be recorded and available for viewing after today's presentation. Thank you for attending. I will now hand it off to Dr. Jazoba Bonodi to introduce today's presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you're listening to. Welcome to this IVAC seminar. It's my pleasure to uh, moderate this session today with my esteemed uh, panelists, who you will get to meet in a minute. Before we meet our esteemed panelists, I just want to um, set the stage for the discussion we're going to have today. As we all know, COVID-19 pandemic has had unprecedented health and economic impact across the globe. This map from Johns Hopkins shows where COVID-19 has affected and it indicates that every part of the world, every country has been so affected. With more than 40 million cases, more than 1 million deaths, this is um, a public health emergency of unprecedented uh, proportions. Not only does COVID affect health, we know that there are economic impacts across the globe. Um, passengers, air travel has almost ground to a halt. Um, estimates that about 70% of passengers have declined between January and August, 2020. You can imagine what effect that would have on um, economies around the world. World Bank estimates that COVID will cost sub-Saharan African countries between 37 and $79 billion in output losses. Again, in the US, we have data estimating that within the next one year, the GDP of the US will reduce by an estimated 2.5 trillion dollars with associated job losses at around 19 million. So very clearly, COVID is having both health and economic impacts across the globe. Next slide, please. In order for the world to get back to what it used to be before, we need to deploy diagnostics, therapeutics, vaccines in a strong health system. And we need to deploy it in ways that are effective, efficient, equitable. In April, stakeholders, global stakeholders came together and established an accelerator program called the Access to COVID-19 Tools Accelerator, otherwise called the ACT Accelerator. Mm. This is a groundbreaking collaboration to accelerate the development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines. Next slide, please. So here is the structure of the ACT Accelerator. And the topic of today's discussion is one of the pillars of the ACT Accelerator. There are three pillars um, to the ACT Accelerator. These are the vaccine pillar, the therapeutics pillar, the diagnostics pillar. And underscoring these pillars are the is the health systems connector because the, both the vaccines, the drugs and the diagnostics cannot deliver themselves without a strong health system. And the key partners who are involved in these pillars to ensure equitable access to these tools across the world are 
CEPI, GAVI, Wellcome Trust, UNITAID, WHO, the Global Fund, and several others um, mentioned in the previous slide. For today, we are going to focus on the vaccine pillar, and my esteemed panelists will discuss exactly what those pillars intend to do, how civil society organizations can play a role in ensuring the success of the, of the vaccine pillar, and what you as a regular citizen, as a public health expert, as a, as a government official, wherever you're listening to, or wherever you're listening from, what you can do to support the success of this pillar. Next slide, please. So one thing to bear in mind before we start off is that the Act A accelerator, the pillars, have at its core certain principles that we as CSOs must play an important role in promoting. This relates to transparency, ensuring that all the decisions are transparently um, accomplished to improve efficiency and accountability. The health products that are on offer are carefully selected and allocated to address public health needs, as we've seen that the regulatory and procurement approaches are flexible and they fit the needs of the different countries. And there, there is strong collaboration. There is solidarity across different countries in order to enhance the scale up of the response. And then finally, the principle of ethics, ethical values are held very strongly. So as civil society organizations, we must keep all these principles in mind while doing um, our work of promoting the um, benefits of the Act Accelerator. Last slide. So with that, I would like to welcome our distinguished panelists. First to go will be Kirsten Matheson. She's the head of policy and advocacy, health and nutrition at Save the Children International. Kirsten is also my colleague at the Gavi CSO uh, constituency platform, where she's played a very prominent role in ensuring that civil society remains engaged in all the discussions around the Act A pillar, particularly the vaccine pillar. Again, um, we're really pleased to have the second panelist, Kate Elder. She's the vaccine policy advisor at Medicine Sans Frontières. Um, access program. Kate has been long in the trenches fighting for medicine access, vaccine access. So you're going to get the benefit of her long years of experience in the discussion that she will present today. So having said that, I would like to hand over to Kirsten to tell us what the COVID vaccine pillar is all about. Kirsten. Thanks, Chizoba. Um, so I will just start, thank you for having me, and I'll just start by giving a bit of an overview about the vaccines pillar, also known as the COVAX pillar, um, and the functions of that, and then to give a bit of an uh, overview of some of the governance structures for the pillar and work streams and how civil society has been engaged in that, challenges we face, and the role that civil society can play in really delivering on some of the goals of the COVAX facility. Um, so the vaccines pillar, the COVAX pillar, the main aim is to accelerate the development and manufacturing of COVID-19 vaccines and really importantly to guarantee fair and equitable access for all countries around the world. So there are three main components of the pillar. Um, there's the COVAX facility, which is coordinated by Gavi, and that's essentially the global procurement mechanism of COVAX. Um, and it's charged with making the investments across a, a broad portfolio of promising vaccines, and then also pooling purchasing power from all participating countries countries, and then importantly, as I said, to help ensure that they're equitably distributed across um, to help protect the most at-risk groups. And this will be, this aspect of it is heavily guided by the WHO allocation framework to make sure that the vaccines get to the most at-risk need populations. 
Then another component of the pillar is the COVAX AMC, the Advanced Market Commitment, which is essentially the financing instrument to support the participation of 92 low and lower middle income countries within the facility. And this is really critical to helping to ensure that the vaccines get to low income countries. So it's not just your ability to pay that gets you access to the vaccine. And then there is the country readiness and delivery aspect. And this is delivered jointly by Gabby, UNICEF and WHO. And this is about ensuring the infrastructure and technical support so that the COVID-19 vaccine can be safely delivered. So within with this, you can go to the next slide, sorry. Um, so within the COVAX facility, there's the kind of governance structures, so where some of the decision making and advisory structures come into place. And while it was repeated that there wouldn't be any new governance structures that would be using existing governance structures, in fact, new governance structures have been set up. Um, and so it's with these new structures, it's become really important to make sure that civil society and communities are engaged and represented within those structures so that we have a seat at the table as discussions are happening and as decisions are being made. In particular, for example, as you can see on the diagram, the Sh Shareholders Council, as well as the Stakeholders Group of the COVAX AMC. So civil society has been raising concerns about the makeup of these new uh, governance structures and because of the lack of representation of civil society within them in the proposals that have been shared, as well as lack of representation from implementing countries. So the 92 AMC countries I mentioned earlier, which is critical if we are to, as Chisoba talked about, some of the principles of the Act A, these are two key constituencies that need to have a seat at the table as decisions are being made. In addition to the new governance structures that have been set up to deliver on COVAX, there are also existing Gavi governance structures that will be used around decision making, where many of these civil society do have a seat at. Um, so we will have an entry point there, for example, on the Gavi board. So we have one civil society seat on the Gavi board in addition to an alternate seat. However, just to add a little caveat there as well, that there's been longstanding concerns that this is actually insufficient given the size of the constituency and the role that civil society plays in supporting immunization programs. And so there's been a longstanding ask of the civil society constituency to have better represent representation on the Gavi board as well. Um, we also have a CSO seat on the Market Sensitive Decisions Committee, the Program and Policy Committee, Evaluation Committee, and Audit and Finance, which will all be quite crucial around decisions made around COVAX. We can go to the next slide. So then in addition to these governance and decision-making structures um, that have been established or pre-existing ones to help deliver on COVAX, there are also a number of multi-stakeholder work streams that have been set up or in the process of being set up to help support the facility. And so these come under three main categories around development and manufacturing, policy and allocation, and procurement del delivery at scale. And then there's the overarching one, which you see on the left, which is the COVAC coordination meeting. And these work streams are anticipated to be in place for about 12 months with possibility of extension that will be examined early next year. You can see in green where there are proposed CSO representation within the work streams. Um, and this is being worked on now. Um, so the process to select CSO representatives to these different work streams should hopefully be finalized shortly. Um, however, it's not been a smooth ride. Um, and there's this follows a lot of advocacy to get these CSO seats in place. Um, so just a little bit more on that. So when the ACT Accelerator was established, there wasn't a universal mechanism for civil society engagement. So if I can add civil society and community engagement, which is also critical to that. And there, from early on, there have been calls from civil society and communities to make sure that they are meaningfully engaged across the whole ACT Accelerator. And, but within the different pillars that Chizoba talked about earlier, the process has been varied. Um, in particular for the COVAX pillar, it, it's been a bit of more of a challenging journey to get there. Um, so the therapeutics and diagnostics pillar, 
they were civil society community engagement was established very early on within those and the groups truly represent an inclusive group of stakeholders discussing and making decisions around those pillars so right from the get-go there were interim reps selected and then following the interim reps there was a cso led open and transparent process to select permanent representatives to both of those groups similarly for the hs health, health system strengthen and connector pillar um, there are three interim civil society reps and we, we're expecting soon a recruitment process for permanent representatives and then there's also an overarching um, facilitation council that sits across all of the act accelerator and there as well as immediately after it was set up two temporary civil society reps were included and the process is ongoing now for selecting permanent reps with the COVAX pillar, it's been a bit slower and there's been some more resistance and challenges to getting civil societies on that. Um, and this is quite unfortunate because it's forced civil society and communities to swallow up a lot of their energy and time calling for their inclusion rather than getting on the business of delivering on the objectives of COVAX, which we're all committed to delivering on and advancing the goals of what it set out to deliver. Um, many of you might already know or may, may have been involved in some of this advocacy. So there was a lot of advocacy towards um, the pillar leads of the vaccines pillar. So WHO, Sepi and Gabby on the issue, including a number of civil society letters to the leads, to the Gabby board, um, requests made during CSO calls set up by the pillar, as well as bilateral advocacy from a number of organizations. And following a lot of this pressure, um, as well as wide support from other partners and stakeholders, the Vaccines Pillar leads finally issued a global call for nominations from CSO and community reps, um, which is a process I mentioned before. So there will be nine CSO reps to, the ni to nine of the work streams, the ones mentioned in green, as well as the coordination meeting. Um, however, also that there were some concerns from civil society that the process was launched by the pillar leads rather than by civil society and there's a strong principle within the within the civil society constituency that these sorts of processes should be led by civil society themselves um, and it's how it's been done across the other pillars and in history around global health that we select and lead the process for selecting our own representatives. Um, however, civil society has now taken on the leadership and we are owning that process. And as I said, in the process of finalizing those reps. So hopefully those positions will be in place soon. And then kind of in parallel to this process, there's the remaining concern about civil society representation in the governance structures. So the, um, the shareholders council and the stakeholder AMC stakeholders group and this is ongoing but we are hopeful that this will be resolved soon and we will have CSO reps within both of those. Um, if you can go on to the next slide and as I mentioned before just a flag CSO reps but we're also very much pushing for representation from the implementing AMC 92 countries which is also really critical for the success um, of the facility. So why do we need civil society participation? This should be obvious, hopefully. Um, but we've had we have made this case to the pillar leads. Um, we shouldn't have to make the case, but we have, and there's really strong grounding of why civil society and community engagement is so critical. Um, so as Chisova mentioned, the COVAX facility and Gavi, it's founded on the principles of inclusion and equity. And so the governance mechanisms must represent this. Um, and also the CSO reps within these different groups, they also have the opportunity to tap into such a wider CSO constituency, covering an extensive network of expertise, experience, on the ground knowledge, geographic reach. For example, the wider the Gabby CSO constituency includes 600 plus organizations across the world. Um, and there's a COVID-19 access group, which is a large CSO group that holds extensive experience and expertise in access to medicines. Um, the civil society constituency holds knowledge on advocacy, communications, political will, research, intellectual property, licensing, clinical trials, market shape and procurement supply systems, social market, I can go on and on. We have extensive knowledge. We're quite a broad, the breadth and depth of the CSO constituency is huge and it can really be tapped into and leveraged to help promote and move forward and achieve the goals of COVAX. And 
what's important as well is that when the CSO reps are selected, that they also have a clear accountability to this wider constituency to make sure they're not only sharing relevant information, but also soliciting wider inputs from the constituency, which can help then strengthen the delivery of the COVAX facility. So if you go to the next slide. it's going on. There we go. I, I apologize because there is a lot on this. I'll just touch on a couple of key points. Um, but also just the, the role and value that civil society and community engagement will bring to the COVAX um, pillar. So, so as I said, it's vital for the success of the facility. But we can put some, some examples of the role that civil society would play, for example, and this is just some examples. But for example, um, intensifying the focus on equitable global access, especially at a time when vaccine nationalism is threatening to undermine the goals of the end success of the ACT Accelerator and the Vaccines Pillar, helping to drive decision actions and mechanisms that are needed to help ensure equitable access, um, advocating for resources needed for the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX pillar, um, which will then also help support vaccine delivery systems, building political will for immunization, including policy and financing decisions at national level, building public trust and demand for vaccination and any future COVID-19 vaccine, and increasing demand within communities, elevating the viewpoints and needs of communities, particularly the most marginalized. So these are just some of the examples of what civil society brings to the to the discussions, to the decisions, and why we need to have a seat at that table. So I will end there and pass it back over to, to Zoba or right over to Kate. Thanks, Kerstin, for an excellent um, description of the structure of the um, COVAX killer. Um, without much ado, I think I'm just gonna hand over to Kate to tell us more about what it takes to um, fight for access for vaccines and medicines and what we expect um, the civil society input to be in this respect. Kate? Thanks, Dr. Tizova. And thanks very much to IVAC for organizing this webinar. It's nice to virtually see so many of you on the attendees list. Um, lots of new names, but lots of um, familiar friends. So thank you very much for inviting uh, MSF. Can I please have the next slide, Andrew? So why do we even need to talk about equity of access to future COVID-19 vaccines? Uh, shouldn't we just assume that, um, that people in developing countries are gonna get them at the same time as people in developed countries, like I'm sitting here in the United States? Um, no, that shouldn't be the assumption. If history is any lesson for um, what we can anticipate for access to these future COVID-19 vaccines, we have to be prepared and we have to start um, fighting right now for access to people who need them um, all over the world, not just the wealthy few that will be able to afford them. And a recent um, announcement by an analysis from Oxfam and UNAIDS is that so far already, 13% of the world, uh, primarily wealthy countries, have already bought up more than 50% of the volume of the leading five uh, vaccine candidates. So that's a very concerning statistic. I think everybody's been following the advanced market, uh, the advanced commitments um, of a handful of countries to buy up stock of potentially promising vaccines. The graphic on the right was published recently by the Financial Times in terms of the, um, where countries have already bought volumes of which specific products. You can see that the UK government, for example, has bought enough vaccines that if they are all successfully licensed, they would have five vaccines for every um, British citizen. So um, when you look at those sorts of doses per capita and then compare it to countries, for example, countries where uh, Medicine Sans Frontier works, which have no assured um, access right now, it's incredibly consuming, uh, concerning. Um, the price ranges, what prices are going to be um, set for these vaccines are also unknown. We have some indication of prices, price ranges perhaps from $4 uh, per person if we are assuming a two-dose schedule to up to $70. But in the access field, we always know having enough supply at the affordable price are the key components to ensuring equity. So I think really the litmus test for this global pandemic and when we do have vaccines available is 
Will a person who's at highest risk in a developing country have access to COVID-19 vaccines at the same time as a high risk person um, in a developed country? Or are we gonna potentially end up in a situation where um, somebody who uh, is not at high risk let's say a 20 year old healthy individual sitting here in the borough of Brooklyn in the United States of America is getting access to a vaccine before a frontline healthcare worker in a country like South Sudan. And that will mean that we have not achieved um, our goals, the goals set out in the COVAX facility and what we all on this webinar want to see in terms of equity of access. Can I have the next slide, please, Andrew? So just as I noted before, you know, we're not assuming that equity is going to be inherent in this um, model of delivering COVID-19 vaccines. And why? I mean, why is that our assumption that we're starting from? Um, because maybe the, the COVID pandemic is new, but the issues around access to medical tools, diagnostics, um, future vaccines, those issues are not new. Um, those of us that work in vaccine access, those of us at Medicine Sans Frontieres that are um, always fighting to have access to vaccines for the populations we serve time and time again have been met with the challenges of getting access to those tools. Again, at the correct supply in a timely manner at affordable prices. So this is just a snapshot um, historical uh, media, um, title, media headlines um, from trying to get access to HPV vaccine um, from Merck and GlaxoSmithKline for countries of the world that have the highest burden of cervical cancer, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, and the shortages that we still have for getting those HPV vaccines to meningitis um, C vaccines, to pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. Medicine Sans Frontieres ran a campaign targeting Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline a few years ago to try and get access to pneumococcal conjugate vaccine for the populations we serve, which we were not able to for a number of years. Part of that campaign was successful, but those were some of the tactics that we need to use to really push industry to be accountable um, to people across the world. So, COVID is new, but the issues surrounding our concerns for future access to COVID-19 vaccines is not new. We come up on them time and time again because we still uh, have the same research and development uh, biomedical um, paradigm where we haven't yet addressed some of the systemic issues that bar people from getting access to vaccines. Next slide, please, Andrew. So what is actually needed then to improve access to future COVID-19 vaccines? Well, uh, Kirsten and Chizova started to talk about it. We're on the right path um, with what WHO and other leading global health entities have been trying to do in formating uh, the ACT Accelerator. But we need a global framework for sharing vaccines, right? We need public health criteria that everybody, governments, uh, as well as pharmaceutical corporations will commit to so that the doses that are available of COVID-19 vaccines are given to people based upon public health criteria, not based upon how much your government can pay and how much they push themselves to the front of the line. We need to increase the manufacturing capacity. There have been some studies that say um, there is sufficient manufacturing capacity across the world. Um, so we need to make sure that we use every manufacturer that has the ability to produce WHO pre-qualified vaccines and scale them up um, so that they can produce um, these doses um, at scale so everybody can have access to them. Uh, vaccines that are suitable for developing country health context. Of course, this is very important for organizations that are, that are delivering vaccines. I'm sure many people on this call have been following um, the different platforms that are being used to develop COVID-19 vaccines and some of the characteristics, the product characteristics around those vaccines. Some of them will require um, extreme uh, cold chain, ultra cold chain, which is obviously difficult in a lot of country contexts. So it's not only about having vaccines, it's about, of course, having efficacious vaccines that are easy enough to deliver in low resource settings. And we need to have the affordable prices too. There has been a tremendous public investment in developing um, these COVID-19 vaccines. Some companies have had virtually all of their research and development financed by the public purse. By some estimates, there's been more than $5 billion of taxpayer and philanthropic funding that has gone into the R&D of these COVID-19 vaccines. 
huge public subsidies. And yet the pharmaceutical corporations are still the ones that are allowed to decide what prices they set for these vaccines at what volumes they produce them and who they sell to first. So we've got to be demanding of our government that for our public money that's gone into them, there's some conditions around what we are going to get back. And one of those conditions needs to be affordability. And of course, um, also incredibly importantly, is preparing countries and preparing health systems to, to receive these vaccines. Um, we have tremendous, the, the global community has tremendous exper experience and expertise in delivering vaccines too, but we can anticipate that delivery of COVID-19 vaccines is gonna be um, beyond um, anything we've ever done. So a lot of preparation needs to happen now. And of course, community sensitization. I think a lot of people are reading as well about vaccine hesitancy, the very real concern of people not accepting vaccines uh, when they're available here in the USA. I believe uh, there are some statistics that a quarter to a third of people in the US to say that they won't take a vaccine when it's available, incredibly concerning. So we have to use our communications tools um, to let people know that although this has been a vaccine development process that has been faster than anything else the world has ever seen, we are still making sure that these vaccines are of the highest quality and passing all of the stringent regulatory requirements that they indeed will be safe and people can be confident that they will be efficacious. Next slide, please, Andrew. So what we need, we need a people's vaccine. Um, one of the tools to do that, one of the tools that's been proposed in terms of having a global platform to equitably distribute vaccines is the Gavi-led COVAX facility um, that Kirsten also already spoke about um, earlier. There are two components of it as well. The AMC component, the advanced market uh, advanced market commitment component, which includes 92 countries um, that Gavi is trying to raise funds for to finance the bulk of those costs um, for those vaccines. And then there are self-financing countries that, if they wish, get to sign up to the COVAX facility through different options. There are options by which they can join and they pay themselves to get access to this, co this COVAX facility. This is the only global procurement platform that exists right now. It's very much dependent upon um, solidarity and cooperation from all governments uh, around the world. It has um, had a tremendous number of governments sign up to it. We all hope for its success. Um, there are some challenges that it faces, which I'll talk a little bit about in a second. But this right now, the COVAX facility is the model for global procurement of vaccines and to distribute those vaccines based upon public health criteria that's being outlined by WHO. Next slide, please, Andrew. So just some distinctions in terms of the two groups, the um, 92 countries of the advanced market commitment and the self-financing countries, because um, there are some distinctions between the two of these. And I think we also, as civil society, need to play our watchdog role to make sure that Gavi and other organizations that are the leaders of the COVAX facility are truly um, upholding those original promises of equity, um, equity that's supposed to be embedded in the DNA of the COVAX facility. So the 92 countries of the A um, they will receive, uh, if we're successful as the COVAX facility, doses for up to 20% of their population. The funds should come primarily from donor governments um, through their overseas development assistance, but governments themselves, those 92 countries, are also being asked by Gavi to share in the cost. Gavi is asking those countries to, to put forward their own domestic resources of a, about $1.60 to $2 per dose. Um, for those vaccines. It's a little bit concerning because this is very much dependent upon how much money Gavi can raise from donors. And so far, um, they've raised quite a bit of money, but they're still short of their $2 billion target by the end of 2020. In terms of the self-financing countries, when I last checked a couple of days ago, 55 self-financing countries in eight territories had signed up, had, had signed the um, legally binding terms and conditions sheet for Gavi to join the COVAX facility. These countries have two options that they can um, choose in terms of their participation. There is an option called the committed purchase agreement where um, they are committing fully in to the COVAX facility. And based upon the doses that Gavi has, they will get allocations from those doses, um, not really with the choice or countries that already have bilateral deals that might not wanna be all in, so to speak, can choose to join through an optional arrangement whereby um, they pay a little bit more upfront, but they have the choice of which doses, which contracts from 
um, the COVAX facility they choose to draw from. For example, the UK government already has uh, an advanced deal on its own with AstraZeneca. The COVAX facility has announced a deal with AstraZeneca. UK government has joined the COVAX facility through the optional purchase uh, arrangement. So they might not want to use the COVAX facility to draw from the AstraZeneca deal that Gavi has brokered since they have their own bilateral deal with AstraZeneca, just as one um, example. So it gives these countries more flexibility in terms of their participation in the COVAX facility. Um, countries in this category get to choose what percentage of their population they want to pro procure for through the COVAX facility, anywhere from 10 to 50% of their population, and they have to pay a down payment. A couple of weeks ago, Gavi had the deadline for down payments um, so that they could capitalize the COVAX facility and continue with their negotiations and sign some deals with pharmaceutical companies. We don't yet know how much money the COVAX facility has raised through these down payments, um, but hopefully there will be information forthcoming from Gavi soon so we have an idea of what's in the pipeline. So those are just the, the distinctions between um, the country uh, categorizations. I think it's very important to sort of underscore um, that the COVAX facility has been an evolving mechanism. It has changed. It has, it has not been immune to the pressures of high income countries, right? They have, they have had to make some compromises too in terms of some of the in, initial um, principles that they set out. So it's, it's imperfect, the world is imperfect. It's trying to do the best that it can and we need to support it to be um, successful and also hold it to account as well. So that it really does drive equity between the 92 countries of the ANC and these self-financing countries. Next slide, please, Andrew. So yes, as I, sorry, uh, the, the COVAX facility is aiming to buy 2 billion doses of COVID-19 vaccines by the end of 2021, a billion doses for the AMC 92 countries and a billion doses for the self-financing countries. Sorry, Andrew. So some of the limitations of the COVAX facility. Well, as I mentioned before, we're in the same position again with uh, being concerned about access to COVID-19 vaccines uh, as we face day in and day out with other vaccines because we have not dealt with the systemic issues of the current research and development paradigm and biomedical paradigm that limit access to people in poor countries. And these are issues around who gets to make decisions of where these medical tools go. These are decisions around what we invest in to develop medicines and vaccines for. Um, so if we're not dealing with those systemic issues, uh, we are gonna find ourselves repetitively in this sort of situation. These are issues that deal with intellectual property. These are issues that deal with who is financing research and development, how that, that, that funding is being used to prioritize um, diseases that we address, and then who gets to benefit from the fruits of those R&D labors. Um, it does require, uh, of course, cooperation by the pharmaceutical industry, which has some of its own motivations as well. We have heard a lot of language from pharmaceutical companies during this pandemic um, that actually has been rather promising. We've never heard many companies before say they're going to charge a not-for-profit price on their vaccines. That is historic. We need to hold them to account. In order to make sure that they're really living up to those commitments, we need to demand transparency so we can assess what prices they set. But I do want to recognize that we have seen um, some steps from industry that we haven't seen before. In the COVAX facility, there are many requirements for governments in terms of their participation, but there are very few requirements from industry itself. So uh, in being awarded these contracts, there are not requirements that Gavi has for industry to engage in technology transfer, open licensing deals, transparency around their costs too. Steps that would um, ensure, uh, ensure that we can scale up manufacturing capacity as quickly as possible without some of the limitations we usually face. So we would have pushed Gavi to go further in terms of the architecture of the COVAX facility on that front. And the governance structures um, still leave uh, room for improvement, as Kristen spoke about before. I won't repeat this, but um, civil society should be part of that. Countries themselves should be part of it as well. And of course, it's going to face challenges of vaccine supply shortages due to the hoarding of wealthy governments, too. There are these governments that have been hoarding vaccines, the UK, the US, other governments are able to participate in the COVAX facility sort of without any um, commitment in terms of what they do with their doses from their bilateral agreements. We should probably be pressuring those governments um, to make further commitments to countries in the AMC 92 cohort, whether it's through committing some portion of the doses that they've already secured or whether it's um, through financing um, of the AMC component. 
Andrew? So we need a better balance. I mean, my, my message is really that we need to better balance the power dynamic between the decisions that industry gets to make and what's in the public's interest. Again, the public has by and large paid for the development of these vaccines. We should be getting um, a lot in return. Um, and equity of access is one of the most basic tenets of that. Andrew? So uh, without further ado, uh, we would welcome questions, but I just want to um, I just want to underscore that access to these vaccines and equity of access to future COVID-19 vaccines can't be assumed. It's a fight that we need to have um, in the public's interest. Civil society is very well placed to do it. Everybody on this call is very well placed to do it. And we look forward to working with you um, in a coalition to do that successfully. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Kate, for a powerfully delivered um, presentation. Um, I'm looking at the question. So we're now in our question and answer session. And I'm looking at the questions that have been um, sent forth and many of them you've already addressed, but I, I still wanna come back to a couple that I think will bear um, further elucidation from you. So Kate, you, you really talked about what um, the, world leaders or developed countries should do, rich countries should do to ensure equitable access to um, the COVID vaccine for everybody. Because I know um, during the, um, about two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, um, there were a lot of discussions around um, COVID and COVAX. And one of the terms that really struck with me is that um, nobody, if everybody is not protected, then nobody is protected. So, but what do you think um, governments of low and middle income countries should be doing in order to ensure vaccine um, equity? Are there some things that they should be doing? Of, um, of lower middle income countries? Yes. Kenova? Yes. And, and um, yes, there's a lot that they can be doing and there's a lot that they are doing right now to highlight those needs. I mean, um, the, the current biomedical R&D paradigm, um, the model of it is very much driven by, by corporate interests. This is where research and develop, despite the huge public investment, um, this is, you know, shareholders, being accountable to shareholders, raising money for shareholders is really what drives the decision of multinational companies right now. If we're going to balance that power, what we need is governments in multilateral institutions, for example, within WHO, within the World Trade Organization, to demand that that paradigm shifts and those barriers aren't there um, for them to be able to produce you know, to build their own capacity, to be more self-sufficient in terms of um, development of drugs and vaccines. We've seen some really impressive statements by um, the African Union and the African CDC over the past couple of months in terms of calling for um, suspension of intellectual property barriers that bar access. Right now at the World Trade Organization, um, South Africa and the Indian government introduced a request for a waiver um, that a waiver from the TRIPS agreement, the Trade Related Intellectual Property um, Agreement, that would um, allow governments to waive intellectual property protections for a period of time so that those are not a barrier to them producing their own um, medicines, diagnostics, and vaccines. Um, this is the sort of leadership that we need from governments. This is a fight that's happening right now at WTO, that governments need to come and support what India and South Africa have been calling for. We are in exceptional times. Industry is fighting this tooth and nail to not have these intellectual property uh, provisions uh, waived. High-income countries are pushing back as well in the interest of their pharmaceutical corporations. But these are the types of things that governments can do is follow the lead of South Africa and India to call um, to call for us to use every tool in the toolbox to make sure that medicines are available. So that's just one example of what's happening right now um, that governments can get behind. Excellent. So um, I completely agree with the call for um, strengthening developing countries to have their own vaccine manufacturing base, because that's really in the, in the short to the, in the medium to long term, that's really one of the key solutions for uh, vaccine security. So um, I have another question here. Um, I think this should go to Kirsten. It says, can you speak about CSO participation in COVAX mechanism, such as country readiness and delivery work streams? Um, 
and others? That's the question. I guess this person wants to know to what extent CSOs are engaged and to what extent there are perhaps more opportunities for other CSOs to get engaged in those mechanisms and what value uh, CSOs will bring to those um, to the discussions in those mechanisms. Kirsten? Yeah, thank you, Chisoba. Um, yeah, so a bit of this I talked about um, in my opening remarks and just that so a lot of these work streams, our understanding is a lot of them are in their infancy, so they are still getting off the ground now. Some are established and their mechanisms are being set up, but they're not they're not working yet um, because it, depending on the stage of when they need to be kind of activated is our understanding. But I think it, what's really important is to make sure that CSOs have a seat within each of those work streams. So as I mentioned, there is the process that's being finalized now to make sure that we have a civil society seat, civil society or community seat across the nine work streams of COVAX as well as the COVAX coordination meeting as well, which will have the overview. Um, and so I think that's really critical. But one thing that's really important is to make sure that those CSO reps are connected to the wider constituency. As I talked about, we have a lot of very active CSO groups already previously working on immunization, and that's really grown as well now with COVAX, um, with COVID, sorry, and issues emerging from that. And it's, it's, it's actually really fantastic to see just how activated and fired up a lot of these CSO constituencies are fighting for the issues that need to be addressed to make sure that people in low-income countries in particular get the vaccines they need and get their equitable share. So I think it's really important that when we do have those CSO reps in place very soon, that they are actively engaging with the wider CSO constituencies. And I think the mechanisms need to be sorted out of exactly how that works, but there are pre-existing groups like the Gavi CSO constituency, the COVID-19 access group that are, and there's also an overarching ACT A CSO group, which brings together the CO, CSO reps across each of the pillars of the ACT accelerator. So I think it's really important to make sure that those CSO reps are engaging and have an accountability to the wider constituency, which will not only to share knowledge and information with the constituency so that they can support efforts in their own countries or globally, but also so that they're really tapping into the knowledge of those constituencies. As I talked about before, there is the CSO constituency, it's really hard to classify what that actually means because it is such a wide constituency with so much expertise and knowledge and geographic scope, but that's the a huge value that comes and that we can bring to the discussions and the decisions that are made around it. So I think it's really important to make sure that there is that mutual accountability between the CSO reps and the wider constituency groups. Okay, so just um, continuing from that line of discussion, there's another question that says, um, do we have a database of CSOs working in Africa, especially those um, with interest in vaccination? So I, I think, Kirsten, this leads to the, the point you made earlier about the need to work out the mechanisms by which the CSO reps to these pillars are actually consulting with um, CSOs on the front lines, the CSOs in the different countries. So um, comments on that? Yeah, no, just to say I agree. I think that's really important. So we have those two groups I mentioned have listservs. Um, and just before we close on a final slide, I can give you the email address for those and the key contacts for people that want to join those listservs. Um, there are, for example, a lot of countries have national CSO platforms that working on health, but also many working specifically on immunization, they can be utilized. There are also regional CSO platforms. For example, um, Francophone Africa has the OFRS network um, and there are others. And so I think it's, it's really important to tap into some of those and we can, um, within the Gavi CSO constituency listserv, while it is global, there is a large number of organizations working across different regions, mm -hmm. which we can then see how, it, yeah, I think it would be important to them make sure we have the right networks in the different regions and countries so that it's connected across the globe as we're looking at these issues. And also, because a lot of the issues might come down to, you know, national and regional specific as well. So it's, I think, the next step of making sure we have the right mechanisms in right. place to tap into the constituency. Right. So pivoting a bit to characteristics of vaccines and um, allocation, Melissa asks about um, the timing. I think this goes to Kate says um, timing and characteristics of vaccines are such unknowns. 
do you have any recommendations for how we should be thinking about the balance of access for low income countries for the best vaccines for their needs versus the first vaccines that are available? So Kate. It's such an excellent question, Melissa. Thank you, because um, in advocating for you know, high income countries that have um, tied up a lot of the doses you know, to make sure they set aside uh, portion so that um, low income, low and middle income countries can get access at the same time it would be, um, you know, horrible if we saw them setting aside uh, doses of not, you know, appropriate products or the least desirable products. Um, so, so it's a very in important question. I mean, balancing um, the product characteristics with the context that, that need them. I don't have the answers. I just know that there are um, working groups right now that are looking at how you prioritize, for example, Gavi's investments to the COVAX facility um, into products that they think would be most suitable for all of the contexts that Gavi is trying to, um, to cover. So there's obviously tremendous um, experience and expertise within um, the World Health Organization on preferred product characteristics. Um, and how you make sure that you have a product that's suitable for the cold chain capacity and the delivery system of, um, of least developed countries around the world. So, yes, what we need to do is we need to take that list um, that WHO develops. We need to make sure that that guides the investment of where the money goes that Gavi is raising. Um, and then, of course, the countries are part of that discussion as well, so that they're really the ones that are deciding um, what's most appropriate for their context. But we need, we need pressure from civil society to help do that as well. We need, uh, we need to play our watchdog role um, for any countries that may be donating doses of, um, of volumes to, to developing countries too. There's a lot of talk right now from high income countries about setting aside portions for developing countries. We wanna make sure that it's just not the cast off, right? Of course, that it's um, appropriate for the context where it'll be used. Excellent. Um, here's another interesting question that kind of turns the usual discussion of equity um, on its head a little bit, but based on, on based on data, on fact. So it says here, this question is from Sibada. It says, thank you for the excellent presentation. We have observed that the severity and mortality rates from COVID-19 differs between Africa and Europe and American populations, how would targeted vaccine administration impact Africa? So if you're looking at equity in terms of severity of disease, um, you would put Europe and Africa first, um, unlike in other diseases, other disease conditions where Africa and other developing countries will be put first. So how would you make this balance in um, targeting vaccine allocation and ad administration. Kate. <laughs> I am not medical, so I want to start with that. I, um, so I defer to you, Dr. Chaboza, and others um, on the okay. chat who are um, physicians. But, um, but what I would say is um, in that criteria of allocation, we also need to consider some structural inequities, right? So if somebody um, gets COVID in a developing country, but they don't have the same access to um, treatment as somebody who has COVID in a high-income country, how does that factor in to how we allocate the doses? I think the epidemiology is changing. Everybody's watching it um, and how this pandemic manifests across the world um, and, and, of course, in the context that, um, that MSF works in, we're, we're following it very closely too. But you know, what is happening in densely populated refugee settings? What is it was happening in um, densely populated urban settings? I, I don't know the latest epidemiology um, off the top of my head, but I would just say that we should also build into it some of the structural characteristics in terms of access to, to treatment and care if people do get um, COVID. But I, I would um, welcome any points from the medical people. Thanks. Um, so I, you're absolutely right. And I want to add to that. I think that um, the way WHO has structured the allocation right now, um, putting healthcare workers first, as well as um, elderly population first across the country, uh, across the different um, um, countries, I think that really um, speaks to the optimal allocation that will maximize um, health impact as well as economic um, benefits. For example, we know that many, um, in many countries, services were disrupted. People refused to go to health facilities because of fear 
of being exposed by health workers and being exposed in a healthcare setting. So if um, even though mortality or case loads are lower in Africa, there's still massive dis uh, disruptions in the healthcare system. And people are probably dying from other diseases than COVID, even if um, COVID rates are lower. So protecting the healthcare worker, I think will go a long way in raising um, the confidence of people to seek care um, in, healthcare, in healthcare settings and then protect people from dying from other conditions. So um, from current um, estimates, I think the, the number of doses that are being sought by the COVAX facility and, and um, the WHO allocation formula should be sufficient to cover at least those priority groups across all the countries. And hopefully we will not need to um, you know, completely um, not give vaccines to some countries in, in terms of prioritization. So vaccines should come to every country at the same time to the priority groups that have been uh, set aside by the WHO allocation formula. Okay, so um, one, let me take another uh, question. Uh, Kirsten, I think this one should go to you. It says, um, CSOs do play a role in reducing vaccine hesitancy. Um, could they provide trusted voices? What additional, I guess this question is saying, what additional role could they play apart from um, advocating for equitable allocation of vaccines? Or what additional role could they play to ensure that vaccines are taken up when they are deployed in countries? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think that's such a critical role for CSOs as well to play. So longstanding before the COVID, before the pandemic and the COVID vaccine, as we're looking at vaccine hesitancy around that, this has been a longstanding role that civil society has played. They often have the trust of communities, um, are closest to the communities, particularly the most marginalized and deprived communities, so play such a critical role in building that trust. Um, this is particularly important around um, in the current context where there's in a lot of countries, a lot of mistrust of governments and handling of the pa pandemic and vaccine hesitancy linked to that. So that you need other players that really have the trust of the community to be stepping in and really building that trust and building the demand for the vaccine. And I think linked to that as well, it's around also empowering communities and recognizing, you know, with the right information, the right to health, the right to access vaccination, and why it's so critical to protect them from disease. So they have a lot of a role to play and it's a large number of CSOs and working within communities and other influential people within communities as well. I know there was a question before also about faith-based organizations, for example. So I think it's looking also at civil society organizations within their entirety um, and how we can work together at the national and community level to build that trust and build the demand for when a vaccine comes um, is rolled out. But I think also just to say that it's really important then why civil society needs to be involved from the beginning. And this is why we're really pushing for civil societies, organizations to be in communities to be involved within these structures from the get go, because you can't just wait until the vaccine is ready and to be rolled out within the community. It needs to be from the beginning. So we're to see that end to end view of the vaccine from manufacturing, from production manufacturing to rollout and um, delivery. Um, so Thanks. yeah, they play a critical role in that. Thank you. So the final word, Kirsten, goes to you. I believe you have two additional slides to tell us, so what? After nearly one hour of discussing this topic, what should you do? What can people take away from this discussion? So Kirsten, take it home. <laughs> um, so we just wanted to wrap up this webinar with a couple of slides. One, just to give that kind of overview of, you know, looking ahead. I know Kate talked to some of these already. I talked to some of these as well. But what are some of these key priorities looking ahead and the role for, for civil society within them? Um, as we've said over again, is that meaningful engagement of civil society and communities, but also really that meaningful engagement of implementing countries, low, lower middle income countries um, within the governance and decision making structures to really ensure the success of it and ensure equitable access. Um, that accountability between the CSO reps when they are selected within the wider constituency, I won't go into that in any more detail because I've talked about that already. Um, as I've just talked about now, the kind of end-to-end -end view of delivery um, from manufacturing to delivery, 
also looking across the vaccines pillar at a, as a whole. So, you know, both from, from the manufacturing side, but also in the policy decisions, but also looking at the allocation frameworks. It needs to be seen as a whole that are all contributing to what's needed to ensure equ equitable access. Um, and then, yeah, the inclusion to really sure we're, make sure equity and cl inclusion really drives um, the facility and access to the COVID vaccine. And, you know, there have been excuses that in the interest of speed, it's moved ahead without involving all stakeholders. And that's, it's not a viable excuse. We need to involve all stakeholders in the decisions and discussions around it. Um, ensuring sufficient investment, and this includes not just on the manufacturing side, um, but also really ensuring that the sufficient investment in the advanced market commitment and to make sure and so that low income countries get their fair share and ensuring sufficient investment around the delivery systems in low income countries as well. Ensuring adherence that we're, complying with the WHO's global allocation framework um, and addressing issues around vaccine nationalism, um, other issues, a lot of the issues that Kate has talked about around making sure that we have the right mechanisms in place to ensure kind of global mechanisms so that we can ensure equitable allocations and addressing a lot of those systemic issues around equity that are needed. Um, also expanding supply, scaling up vaccine production. So points around increasing emerging market manufacturing capacity, addressing um, IP issues, know-how tech transfer, and the roles of, for example, this there's the CTAP mechanism that was set up that was helped supposed to help deliver on some of this, um, but it hasn't really been utilized. So how can we push forward to use some of those mechanisms, mechanisms that have been set up? And then an, the really critical one around country preparedness, including the demand generation and addressing vaccine hesitancy. If you go into the final slide, just some points of call where um, those on the call and other um, CSOs can take some action around this. For example, there are two big initiatives that are out there now, um, the People's Vaccine Movement and the Free the Vaccine Movement, which are movements to really push for um, equ equitable access to safe and effective vaccines. Um, we have as I've talked about already, some key CSO groups that are very active and engaging in these discussions. Um, so if you see the emails there, as well as the contact to join those groups. Um, and this is hopefully as well where a lot of the information will be coming through um, to the wider constituency from the CSO reps and where you can feed in perspectives and inputs to that. And then the vaccine pillar leads organize a CSO briefing with the wider constituency, which is an open call. Um, it's been about month Monthly, um, and it's a good place to just get updates on the vaccines pillar and an opportunity to ask questions and also hopefully challenge um, where there are issues that need to be addressed and to push the facility further to make sure it's really delivering on its objective. Okay, thank you very much. We are two minutes over time. I just want to um, thank my panelists who have delivered a solid uh, presentation uh, for us today. Um, Kate and Kirsten, thank you so much for, for joining us. And for the listeners, um, wherever you may be, you've heard it here. And um, we've left you with some, some takeaway, some call to action. So if you want to know more about the COVID vaccine pillar, COVID vaccine initiatives, the easiest way to, to actually get a front seat uh, view is to join the CSO constituencies here because um, many of the CSOs are represented in the pillars and they're part of the discussion. So uh, the links are in the slides, the slides will be shared. So get engaged, get involved, and let us ensure that everybody has access to the COVID vaccine when they are deployed. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day.